I was edified just hearing you read that, Cheryl. Amen. It's good. Real good. Well, we're in the second chapter, back in the second chapter of First Corinthians, and I come here this morning with a simple, a simple, uncomplicated message. Actually, what God has given us to do is simple. It's, un, it's un, un, uncomplicated at all. Now, we have a deep God, and we have, there's deep things in God, but actually what we've been given to do is, be, is very simple and understandable. Now, Paul, he's made it clear that men without the Spirit can't think like God can think. Amen. However, he, he also says, however, those in Christ Jesus, it's been given to them to know the things of God, you see. And we can handle them mentally, at what the Spirit teaches us. We can handle them. And he makes it perfectly clear this is not possible to those who are outside the domain of the working of the Spirit. Uh -huh. Now, uh, in the next chapter, Paul's going to go into the nitty-gritty of these things, chapter 3. And he's going to make an application of what all this is about. So far, Paul has been talking about the way God thinks. Later, he's going to tell him what God says. And his very last words in this chapter, but we have the mind of Christ. I wanted to start there. Uh, we have the mind of Christ. Now, according to the same letter, further into the letter, in the 10th chapter, verse 11, these things have been written to those who have the mind of Christ. You know what verse I'm referring to. They've been written for our learning. They've been written for our example. We're supposed to learn from them. We're supposed to see something from them. And, these, and we're the brethren who have the mind of Christ. So God is not going to give us something to, that we are not capable of learning. He's not going to put forth before us examples and patterns. That we can't pick it up. You see, but we can. We can do these things. We're supposed to learn. Let me tell you something I see all the time. Brethren are making a big mistake, and uh, the people of God are making a big mistake when, they're, when they let something distract them from the study of God's Word. I'm talking about the, the things we're supposed to be learning from and the examples that's been given us in the Scriptures when we get distracted from them. Uh, there's a way that seems right. The Scriptures say there's a way that seems yeah. right unto a man, right. but the ways thereof are death. Mm -hmm. It's To a man, the natural man, it, this thinking seems right. It seems like this would be the course to go, but, uh, and it, but it leads to death, the Scriptures say. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, the way we live, it certainly concerns our thinking. It's all about the way we think. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. You'll hear people say, uh, I don't know what I was thinking. When I, I did this, or uh, I don't know, I, I just wasn't thinking. Mm -hmm. But you know, the problem is solved. I, I don't want to say, I don't want to oversimplify, but the problem is solved. These kind of things are solved when you come into the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. They are. Uh, if you will submit to the Spirit of God, He will make you an excellent thinker. Amen. I mean, you're gonna, you'll have to think Amen. to navigate in the uh, in the things of God. And that's why He's given us. At the mind of Christ, so we can. Uh, if you will, uh, if you will give yourself to it, men do not, men cannot think like God. And you, uh, you know that uh, uh, the great liability to this, this is the closer we are to the world, the more messed up your thinking becomes. You've met people that just their met their thinking's messed up. I don't, they, they were sincere, good folks, all like this, but their thinking's been messed up, and that's because they've been at too much exposure to men and the thinking of men. Just, they're, they're just staying too close to the earth all the time. Yeah. And, uh, but when you come into the kingdom of God, the, the Spirit, the Spirit of God, He'll set your thinking straight. He'll set, he'll set them up in priorities where you can handle it. Uh, the wisdom that comes from men, it does not include God in His thinking, all it's, and, uh, and God in His thinking, period. Primarily, it, doesn't, it's, it opposes God and is contrary to God. And I'm, I stand here this morning, if I, do any, I don't do anything else, I want to put before you as a reminder, this kind of thinking, uh, the way of the flesh, it, it will engulf everything it comes in contact, contact with. It, uh, it's inescapable, the thinking of men, the thinking of this world. It will intrude, to actually intrude in all things, and it will attach itself uh, to everything in this world, and everything in this realm is dominated by the thinking of this world that comes from men. And, uh, and, the, and, the, and the word of God that we receive, brethren, has been no exception to this, you see. Uh, this thinking that belongs 
to the world, the way men think, it has managed to latch itself on to the, to the, uh, the truth of God, to the word of God. You know this. Uh, it has twisted and has distorted the truth, and, and in effect, it has contaminated, hasn't it? Uh, and, we, what we, and, and it becomes more like a, a, a religious wisdom of men than, yeah. what, we, than what we've been given, the, the truth of God, the word of God. It, um, it professes God, it comes in the name of the Lord, and it uses the same uh, language, the same words that's common to the household of faith. It, it, but, and it, on the outside, it looks like a sanctuary of God, but then on the inside, it operates just like something from the world. You see, that, that's what the thinking of man will do. It will contaminate these kinds of things. But now, uh, God is bringing a salvation, or he has brought a salvation to this world, and it is going to exclude all this stuff is about men. It's going to be, it's going to be here, and then the things of the world is going to be over here. It's, it's going to be distinct and separate regardless of what men try to do to it. It will remain distinct and separate. Now, the saint's sensitivity to God's word, and I think of the brethren here and, and, and different brethren we know of in different places, uh, and our unwillingness to compromise it, it's, it's been interpreted by the world and, and by the religious world as just like a plain intolerance. You, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, it, and it's, it's something that they love to throw at the, uh, our regard for the truth, that we're intolerant. Uh, the yeah. people that uh, hold the word of God in high respect in a God-honoring way, they're called fanatical, mm -hmm. and they're called opinionated. And... Uh, they're, sometimes they're, it, you're uncaring. You, you just don't have. A, you're not loving enough, and you have a narrow way about you. That's that, that's what how they uh, and uh, and how they think about you. But you know, brother, and we have to agree to this. We have to say yes. We uh, we are dogmatic about the truth, Amen. and uh, and our way is a narrow one. Amen. You know, even though even though that that's what they say, we have to we have to we have to take our stand and say we are. Uh, opinionated about the truth, mm -hmm. and we are uh, we are on a narrow and straight way mm -hmm. uh, because there's a good reason that we are mm -hmm. um, that we're intolerant of compromise and, and error. We know there's a, because we know there's a spirit of error, mm -hmm. and we know that uh, any just a trace of human thought or the way men thinks can, can contaminate it. So, what we do we live? This way, we take this posture that we won't let the way men think, and we won't let the world interfere with the way we think and the, and the way we proceed. Um, it's a sad situation. We see it all the time. There's a lot of brethren here that's been pushed to the side, and the institution has just pushed them out of the way because they've regarded the word of truth in such high and honorable way, and they've, they've refused to compromise it. You know, compromises start small, and, yeah. and they go from there. Mm -hmm. The saints, the people of God, we, we continue to plan our lives around what God is doing, around the kingdom of God. And, uh, and so, we, so therefore, we can, we can really actually understand what Paul was saying in the scripture like sec, uh, 2 Corinthians 6, 4. But in all things, we approve ourselves mm -hmm. as ministers of God and much patience and much afflictions and much necessities and distresses, and he goes on with about four verses there of things. But in this way, see, by holding to this position, we prove ourselves as ministers of God. Amen. Advancement in the kingdom is done with a sword in the right hand as we, as we proceed. By the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. I thought of the rebuilding of the wall in the, uh, of Nehemiah's time also. Uh, you know, it required that they'd be, uh, they'd be aware of not only rebuilding the wall of the project, you know, being focused on that, but they had to be aware of those who would try to, to stop them, yeah. right. to, uh, to hinder and stop the work. And it was the design of the enemy. We know about uh, uh, Tobiah and uh, um, Sambalat. Yeah, Sambalat. Uh, some ballad, yeah. And we know about those brothers. That, that it was really a, a, a sore spot to them. That they, he, Nehemiah came back and he had mobilized the people to rebuild the wall. And it was the design of the enemy to stop that work. He wanted to get them down off the wall. And let's talk, let's have a discussion. And he would write letters and, and, and want to meet with them. 
it, it, anything to stop this project. And so, brethren, that's what we, we, we're, we have the same mindset. We don't want to stop and talk. About it. We don't want to have some kind of religious conversation or some kind of religious discussion. We don't want to talk about this thing. We want, we want, to, get, we want to get you involved in the building project, and, and then we can talk along the way, if, you know, but we, we don't want to stop and have all these conversations. Now, what we want to do is we want to, be, we want to, we want to look at what we're doing, and we want to see if is it what God is doing. We, we don't want to think about, say, well, you know, is, is God involved in what we're doing here? But I actually want to ask the question, are we, are we involved in what God's doing? Have we been able to identify the, the, uh, the, uh, the way that the kingdom of God is headed? And, and have we aligned ourselves in, in this way? So that's, that's, why we want, that's the question we want to ask. Uh, we, don't, we, we shouldn't get confused about this. See, there's just too much in the scriptures about what God is doing and what he desires to, to get all bogged down and confused about it. Uh, we ought to be able to look at, at uh, for example, we ought to be able to look at what's around us and we ought, to, we ought to be able to go back to the scriptures and say, was this an emphasis of Paul, for example? Did Peter spend a lot of time talking about this and directing the brethren in this regard? We ought to be able to reason whether what, what, I ha what we put our hands to is really something that's important to God. And uh, we got to be clear about what's going on. And we, we, uh, we want to know what's happening around us. We, we, we're, uh, we're thinking people. You see, we've been given the mind of Christ, and we can, we can think this way. Uh, you know, for example, we've got what we've got on our hands. Uh, and, and in my sermon today, I'll probably make a few references to Babylon and, 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 the, and, the, and, and our enemy, of the faith and, and those who would uh, uh, inst try to institutionalize the word of God and make it a system, you know, and, or, or something like that. But our religious system we've got today is, is no more than the same thing that Jesus confronted in his day. You know, remember then at that time that the great bulk of Israel, the people of God, had been subjected to just the commentaries on the word of God by this time. Pages and pages and piles and piles of it. Commentaries on what God has said. This is what the people of God were, had, had, would be given to them. And what was being promoted by the religious leaders of the day, what they talked about all the time, and the things they compelled the people to do was have very little to do with what God was doing and what God wanted done. You see, that, that's my point. At the time of Jesus, actually the truth and the purpose and the promise of God for a long time had already been buried underneath the ex explanations of what God's word had said. And, uh, and the only way that we survived any of this, brethren, is because God was in charge of this, and he still is. Yeah. And we're, we can be thankful that God didn't place salvation, his purpose, in the hands of men because we see yeah. what they've done to it. God manages his own salvation. He's in, he hadn't given it up to men to do. He's, uh, he's always had a handful of those who had a grasp on his promises, who, under, who uh, had a regard and, a, and an understanding of his purpose and what he was doing. He's always had a handful. He's, God has managed to keep it this way. The, uh, those who had a handle on the promise of God that he was going to bring a Savior, a real Savior and deliverer in, a deliverer in this world. Actually, they were the group from whom the disciples were chosen. From. That was the remnant God had. The disciples were picked from, from that group. Now, you want to look around today, brother, and you want to be able to, to see the parallel that we have. Today we have primarily, mostly, in the modern church, we have commentaries on the Word of God. That we have what, what men have said that the Word of God has said. And this has been promoted and given to the people. We have our teachers and the lawyers and we have our scribes. We have our synagogues and our holy places and all these kind of things today. And, uh, and so the truth of God has been supplanted by the commentaries of men. And, but the people of God now, we want to keep the world out of this. We, we want to be that remnant that God has always had. And we want to stand uh, firm on this you know uh many of us here have had to withdraw ourselves from this kind of thing uh we've we've uh myself for example we've tried to function 
in this in this kind of environment. We've had to. It's become an unclean thing, yeah. and we've had to actually withdraw from it. Now, you uh, brethren who know this, we know that uh, there's really nothing that can be done but to try to the beckon the, the ones that we identify as our as kindred and sensitive brethren. We try to beckon them. Mm -hmm. We try to call them out, and and any reason that we would go into this place would be tried to. Would try to do like Paul did. He he would try to get people to come out, and with the call of the truth, and God. Now God has made it clear He has gone through great effort uh, to bring salvation in a message, and He's done it in a way that's been clear and free of the flesh and the thinking of men. Now, I I wanted to I wanted to say it. Uh, that um, behind the pulpit and from here, that uh, I, I wanted to say that, you know, uh, if, if it comes to mind that the modern church might be an option, that uh, it might be something that's workable, you know, or something that, that uh, we could work with. I, I want to say that uh, the modern church is not, the institution is not an option at all for the believers. It's not. It's a place, brethren, for false prophets and false teachers and people who follow after them, okay? Amen. Even though we have brethren who are there. And uh, God continues to have his remnant. He will. And God, God will bring his people together and, and bring them one. He will save his people. The people of God were not limited by where we worship and how we worship. We can, we, we're free to do these things. Now, our apostle Paul, he stands as premier guardian of the truth of God. He protected the saints against heresies and false teachers at every turn. If the grievous wolves or false teachers wanted to get at the body of Christ, they're going to have to, they're going to, have to contend with the Apostle Paul. They were, going to have, they were going to have any freedom with peddling the wisdom of men, they're going to have to wait till Paul was gone somewhere else or until Paul was gone to do it. Because he, he was right on it. If they, if they slipped in, he was right back on it. He, he, was, he was a guardian for the truth of God. Amen. And, uh, and we benefited from that. Paul knew this. Paul knew this. He told the elders, remember, after my departing, there will arise for grievous wolves from your own number, drawing disciples after themselves, speaking perverse things, not sparing the flocks. So that... Paul knew this, that after my departing, men will come, and they did. So when we get up here, when the brethren get up here, and we sound like we're nitpicking about the modern church and the institution and the wisdom of men and the way men think, it's because, it, because of the situation, because we, we want to guard our brethren uh, 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 of the truth. We say again, what men regard as a wise thing is foolishness to God. And the other side of that is true, too. And the wisdom of God is foolishness to the world. God was pleased to save those who believe by the foolishness of preaching. Yeah. This is what God did. God did this. And Isaiah 64, 4 is a text that Paul uses. Say I read, for since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor received by the, uh, perceived by the year. I'm reading from Isaiah. Neither hath the eye seen, O God, beside thee, what he hath prepared for them that waiteth for him. And then, of course, Paul, he takes his verse and he, he, he changes very little of it. He almost quotes it. But it was God who prepared these things. You see, it was outside of this world and outside the thinking. Man, it had nothing to do with it. God had prepared and he had created all these things beforehand. Already made preparations, I said, for those who waited for him. And Paul said, for those who love him. Isaiah declares, O oh God, beside thee no man knew. Now, nobody knew these things. They had no access to them. That's, that's how he kept it free and clear from any contamination. It was beyond the mind of men. Man could not imagine, couldn't even imagine the things that God had prepared. There's no way man could imagine these things. He could never, he could have never uh, thought of or conceived of reconciliation uh, by a Savior mm -hmm. or, or the intercession uh, through a mediator by the same Savior, and uh, and and on and on about God, way God brought salvation to men. Men could never have conceived of this. Matter of fact, the best that men could do in regards to salvation, Paul sums it up in in the first chapter of Romans. 
uh, because that when they knew not God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish hearts were, thought, were darkened. And then he goes on and just kind of reminiscent of our text here. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. So we right there, we can see the very best that man could do without God yeah. uh, and, and trying to capture anything that God had planned. Now, uh, we, uh, we know that men are still this way. They, they try to grasp the truth in the word of God, but they, they don't come empty-handed to him. Now, if we notice how Paul is careful to, to say that God prepared here, you see that. Uh, he's given glory to God and honor to God like, he, like we should, but he, he wanted to make it clear, and we see that the sovereignty and the purpose of God is declared here. It's that it was a purpose that God was in total control of. That he, It was a, a, a purpose and a decision that was decided upon before the world was created. It's kind of like the absolute and uh, sovereignty of God is first uh, declared by Paul. Now, this is the first thing that we've got to come to grips to or come to terms with when we come into the kingdom of God, that God is sovereign and that he is, he is absolutely he is absolutely in charge of everything. Amen. We may not understand very little when we first come into the kingdom. But if we've got this, if you, if you understand, you believe that God is sovereign, he's absolutely in every, uh, sovereign, and everything is it's in, under his control, it's his purpose, then you'll, you'll make quick advancement in the things of God. You don't have a lot to get over. Um, so we want to make sure people understand when they come into the kingdom about the sovereignty of God. And, uh, and you know, that's, for, that's the, do you, do you remember ever learning any of that in the institution? Now, you've got to learn about other things instead. Now, uh, it's what God has given to us. It's what God has given us to see. Amen. It's what God has given us to hear. And it's what God has given us to know. These are the things that we focus our attention on, Paul is saying here. Uh, we would never, uh, we would never realize many of the things, well, not, we would never realize any of the things of God if, uh, if, we had, if we had continued in the way that we was headed. You know, if we, if we had like felt like that what we had our hands on was the purpose of God and the intentions of God, we would have never realized uh, the, about the immeasurable uh, uh, scope of the salvation of God. We would never have even, well, this is what Paul was saying, we would never have been able to imagine the unsearchable riches of God or, or that there was unsearchable riches of God in Christ Jesus, that we were not able to comprehend with all the saints what the breadth and the length and the depth and the height, that, that, that these are things that were made available by God. We had no idea that they were there. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has imagined the things that God has prepared for those who love him. By saying this, Paul is, is essentially declaring that what God is, is doing is a new thing. These are like things that's never been seen. These are things that's never been heard. These are things that's never been, have entered in our minds. These are things that God is doing. And even to us, that who they were meant for, we still have, we, we're still limited by our, our ability to grasp these things because of our temporal realm. So and now in the next few verses, Paul talks about how God has addressed this circumstance, that we've been limited in this way. God has given us a lot of abundance in this regard, but we're limited in, in our apprehension of them. But see, Paul is going to address this. How has God made provisions for the saints to, to see and to know and to grasp these things mentally? Well, God has made a provision for this. Now, for those who cling to the wisdom of men that they, they desire these things, well, they, they're going to be excluded from what Paul is fixing to describe to us. And, to, um, and so now we have these things that God has given us, but we can't, the eye can't get them. That we can't hear them and we can't grasp them, but we got a but God in verse 10. We have another one of those but God. This is when God steps in and he, he gets involved and he changes things. We, when, uh, when there's a lot of but gods in the scriptures. I, I, we love the but gods. Uh, it's, it's, how we've been, this, it's how we're being saved. It's, it's through these but gods. Uh, um, it's when God gets involved and he, he, he makes it applicable to us. And he makes a, he, what a but God is a provision. 
is what that is. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love was with he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, he quickened us together with Christ. But God got involved, and he made these things applicable to us. But God had to reveal them. Here's the but God. Had to reveal them to us by his spirit. Amen. For the spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. About eight or uh, seven or eight times, God is used in the scriptures here. And not only God, uh, Christ is referred to. And the Holy Spirit, of course, is mentioned here. We have the Godhead. It's, uh, it's all in this together. Paul brings all of the Godhead together. We have God the Father and the Holy Spirit. And Christ is mentioned here in the very last verse. We have the mind of Christ. It had, it, uh, this text of scripture, this block of scripture here, it has, it has to do with who knew what about salvation and when they knew it. And uh, it 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 doesn't and it doesn't surprise you to see that it was all the Godhead was involved in this purpose and this a desire of God. They were all in, involved in this. That the, the Father He doesn't operate and work uh, in isolation from the Son of God and the Holy Spirit. They are one. You see, they they think alike all the time about the same thing. It's not like we being one here. This is a divine one. This, this is a, a kind of one is a, that God has. We're going to share in this, but they, they, they can be one in this way. So the eternal purpose of God and the, the counsel, the determined counsel of, of, a determined counsel of his will, it, this is the Godhead we're talking about. And the spirit of revelation, it, it, he was there as well, the Holy Spirit. And uh, he was at the heart, you see, of what God wanted to do. He had entered in on this uh, as his purpose. And, and, and Christ, he had entered in this, but like, it's his purpose too. As all of them, as, as the Father's purpose had, was their purpose. They were completely united in this. Amen. We have the saints, he says. We have uh, the Spirit of God, but God had to reveal them unto us by his Spirit. He was going to reveal those things that needed to be made known. The Spirit of God was going to do it. Uh, this, the deep things of God, the, the Holy Spirit was going to make them things known to the saints. The things that the eye couldn't see and the ears couldn't hear and the mind couldn't The Spirit was going, to, was going to handle these things. You know, the Spirit was there. The Holy Spirit was there. He knows all about the purpose of God, God's desire for the recreation of men, uh, the being created after the image of Christ Jesus. The Holy Spirit was in on this from the very beginning. Amen. That God, He wanted to create uh, for Himself a glorified people, uh, someone of a people that He could inhabit and, ha and be one with. It was going to be a people. It's going to be creatures unlike any other. But the Holy Spirit knew what. He knew what the mind of God was about this and how he thought about it. He, he, he had the same thoughts and affections and the same desires as the Father. So did the Son. So when we think about the Son on the face of the earth and plodding along after the will of God, then you can, you can understand that he was, he, was, he was grasping and he had this understanding of what the Father wanted. This whole enterprise of God's purpose and salvation is going to require God to show something of, of himself. I, I, want, I got these things I want to be seen, and the Spirit, of, the Spirit is going to enter in on this, and they're they going to show it to, uh, and, and reveal this. And the, the Spirit of God, he knows all about it. It's going to be an, uh, a demonstration of the glory of his grace. And uh, so, they, so the Godhead goes about, and they create a purpose and a reason by which God can show uh, for his grace and the spirit he is a witness brethren to all the details of what God has done yeah. he, he was involved in, uh, in, in the birth of, his, of Jesus Christ and his death he was involved in the resurrection and all the workings of his grace and how it was to be the work, how it was to be worked out. The Holy Spirit was doing these things with Mary and Joseph and the lineage and, and all this. Uh, John the Baptist, the choosing of the twelve, and and all these accounts that we have in the Scripture. The Holy Spirit, He's working behind these things and, and He's revealing them and making these things known to the brethren. The Spirit of God was there on the day of Pentecost. Remember, He come came a uh, uh, suddenly there came a sound from heaven like a mighty uh, rushing wind 
It was all ordained of God and searched out by the Spirit of God. And, and uh, <clears throat> brother, it was known by the Spirit that teaches us all things. All what was all that was known by the perfect knowledge of God, you see, everything that he knew, it was known by the all-seeing eye of the Holy Spirit. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm wanting to create a, a, a special affection or, or, or a special sense of the Holy Spirit and God's working in this text and how he, he, he takes these things and he brings them to us. None of these things, okay, that God wanted to do was like hid from the Holy Spirit. You see, he, he was, uh, know all, he knew all these things. Even so the things of, of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. This is what the, the text is telling us. The Spirit of God, now he knows all these things. The words in verse 13 are, 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 is, a, is a word that Paul lived by. Yeah. This, this is the, the verse in uh, 13, is a, it's, and I'm going to expect you to read it if you're interested. But verse 13, this is, how, this is how God saw him, this is how Paul saw himself as a spokesman for God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom speaks, teacheth, but which the Holy Spirit teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Now, that's the way Paul talked, you see. That's the way he approached the brethren in this regard. Now, we can understand why Paul talked like he did in the very beginning, in, 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 in the very opening to the, uh, to the Corinthians. He refused to preach using words men's. He refused to come in there and try to relate to them at their Lower level. He came in there, they had lower level. He didn't start there. He started up there, and they had to come up to him. He gave, instead of giving preference for uh, other words, he gave, he gave preference to the words that the Holy Spirit used. The same words that the Holy Spirit teaches us are the words we want to use when we're teaching others, don't we? That's what Paul did. Because we can be sure that the Holy Spirit, he'll never accent the wisdom of men. Uh, he'll never go to the world to get something uh, and try to teach the things of God with it. He won't do that. Christ sent me to preach the gospel, not with the wisdom of man's words. Paul said, I came to you not with excellency of speech or wisdom. My speech and my preaching were not with enticing words of man's wisdom. So you can see how Paul was careful not to, let, not to, uh, to do this. He didn't want... The brethren to be confused about the world and the things that God required. He didn't want to mix them together, you see, in their minds. So Paul, he was always on guard about this thing. And uh, he was always on guard against the deceptions of the day, men who tried to do this. And we're not ignorant of that today. The devil's going to try his very best to compromise the truth he always has. We can expect him to try to do this. But we, but we will, we will stand firm on the truth. You know, I don't think Satan, he, uh, I don't think he's the only one that would despise a small beginning. He would be satisfied with a small beginning. He would start small. <clears throat> we as a body, we want to minister to one another in the same way Paul ministered to the saints. <clears throat> it is the Spirit who knows all things. He is the one that's, he's really doing the teaching. Among us, it's really the Spirit of God, you see, that is ministering among the ministers who minister to one another. There's no doubt in my mind at all that the Spirit of God ministers among the body of Christ and to teach and to instruct in the things of God. God's got things He wants to, us to see <clears throat> and, and things He wants us to hear and He wants the things He wants us to grasp. And the Spirit, is, if, if, if we submit ourselves to Him, we'll get them. <laughs> He'll make sure that we get it. God has set some in the church, the body of Christ. First apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, and after that miracles, gifts of healing, helps, government, diversity of tongues. This is a solid, consistent doctrine throughout the scriptures that the spirit is in charge of this kind of thing because they are dealt with in the writings of Paul because they're, let me say it this way, because they are dealt with exclusively in the writings of Paul, the institutional church has missed this. Okay? And for the same reason that Peter said that they missed him in his day. Paul, what Paul writes is hard uh, to understand. 
So the unlearned and unstable, they twist and distort them. They do this today. We just ignore what basically what Paul says, unless it happens to, to we agree with it. We know that the Lord Jesus has ascended to the presence of the Father. We know this. And from this place in the presence of God, he intercedes for the people of God. And we know that the Holy Spirit is presently among us, ministering among them. And he is the one who is teaching and enabling ministers among us who have been called by God into the work of the ministry. So we're in the work of the ministry uh, uh, among God's people. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And there's a purpose for this, brethren, till we all come into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God and to a perfect man and to the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ. Now what the apostle declares in this passage is in such harmony with the rest of Scripture we just have to conclude some things that if we were going to instruct others, we were going to teach others, then we ourselves have, must have been instructed in these things ourselves. And we, we, we understand that we have to be a protector of these things first. Those things that are freely given of God, they point back to the things that God uh, was pleased to give. They speak of the grace of God, the grace made known in his salvation. It's all about grace, a grace that is from beginning to end. It's all about God. <coughs> Brethren, we're ministers of that grace. We're ministers of God, God's grace. Ministers by the grace of God. Amen. We're ministering the grace of God that's been given to one another. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men teaching us mm -hmm. it is perfectly consistent isn't it in the scriptures that it's the grace of God that teaches mm -hmm. we could not teach it all if we had not ourselves been taught by the grace of God in some measure every, everyone who's come into the kingdom has experienced and seen something of God's grace mm -hmm. in Hebrews we know the Holy Spirit we learn there <coughs> he is to be the spirit of grace, the same, he is, he is called the spirit of grace in Hebrews 10, 29. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye, shall ye be thought worthy who hath trodden under the foot of the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the spirit of grace. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when someone turns, it's what he's saying here, so when someone turns their back on the truth, <laughs> And on the purpose of God, they turn their back on the Father. Mm -hmm. They turn their back on the uh, the Son of God, and they turn their back on the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. Yes. Mm -hmm. By the anointing which ye have received of Him abideth in you, John says, and ye not that any man teach you, but if the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is true, and is no lie, even as it is hath taught you, ye shall abide in Him. Now, we get up here, and the grace of God teaches us how to speak. Paul talks about here how that we speak, not in the words which man speaketh and wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, mm -hmm. comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Now, we already know that Paul, he wanted to teach a, a truth, <coughs> or if he wanted to expound something, he always went back to the scriptures to do it. We have examples of it in our text. He goes back to Isaiah, and he takes that scripture there, mm -hmm. and he brings it over there into his what he wanted to say, and he, un, he enlarges it, yeah, and he yeah. builds from that. Mm -hmm. he, he never, you never see him doing any other, any, using any other method, mm -hmm. for example. He always uses the spiritual to, to talk about spiritual things. Yeah. And he, he does this in Isaiah 64.4. Now, for people to try to compensate in this regard, it's, it's, it really, it's a, uh, it's, a, uh, it's a misdirection, to say the least. Mm -hmm. We want to always go back to the scriptures mm -hmm. and expound from that. And that's why we have these types and shadows and things that's been given to us. And with the holy men 
and the prophets of God, they spoke about a salvation that was to come. They were our foundation from which we go back and we, and we build upon and we, and, we, and we pull and reference from there. We, uh, it was put there. We see Jesus doing this same thing, don't we? The same thing that Apostle Paul done. He went back and, uh, and he would pull from the examples uh, from one of the reasons that God had invested so much time in, com- in cultivating a people of God, one who had, had knew these things, and so that when men came along later, they had a, 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 a pool of reference or a large body of information that we could, we could pull from and go back to. They were ordained of God, you see. They, they belonged to him, so they were sanctified by God for use. You see, so we have really have no other. We have we really have no reason to go to any other source than to go back to the scriptures and to reference them. Amen. We uh, when we when we compare spiritual things with spiritual things, we keep everything in its proper focus. We keep everything in in in, in the perspective that God wants to have. We pray for grace that all God's people would be able to compare spiritual things with spiritual. You know, that we'd be able to, to go back and, and, and say, well, it, it, it says this here, and I can go back, and I could connect it with this over here, and we're, and we're keeping everything uh, hooked up like God in, intends it to be. I wanted to uh, skip over to uh, this thought here. You know, when uh, Nicodemus came to Jesus mm-hmm. that night, and we got the record there, the account. Now, he came sincerely, came at night by himself, and, and he came sincerely seeking some questions. Uh, Jesus had sparked some questions in him and some desire, and he came to him, and, uh, and he asked him. Uh, he wasn't able, quite able to receive some of the things that Jesus said, and, uh, and that's because we see that the natural man, it receiveth not the things... Yeah of the Spirit of God because they are spiritually discerned. Mm-hmm. When, we, when we speak to a co-worker and, they, and, they, and, they, and you get that blank look, you understand, we understand why, we, because the natural man can't receive the spiritual things from God. I didn't know this for a long time. I thought I could go in and, and talk to people, you know, about a lot of things that I was excited about, you know, and, and, and thrilled about. But I came to realize that they had no way of grasping these things. So really we're, the world is limited to what you can talk to them about. You see, now Jesus, first thing he told Nicodemus that a man, first of all, I'm going to tell you some things, but he, he told him a man needs to be born again. Okay. And, you know, I think that Nicodemus, it was a, 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 a sincere uh, remark by him, but it was because he was a natural man. He, it was foolishness to him that he asked a question, can a man... Can a man enter the, the womb and be born again? You see, that this wisdom that, that a man must be born again, this is like foolishness to the mind of man. You see, but see, Nicodemus, he couldn't receive it. But, but once he, but I guarantee you this, but once Nicodemus followed through with what Jesus told him that he needed to do, then the, spirit, the spiritual things of God, they were received by Nicodemus right. because he had that, he had that spiritual mind. How can a man be born when he is old? <laughs> can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Well, the second birth sounded foolish to him, but he was able to receive it once he, once he became uh, brand new. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Before we were born again, there was no other way to think than after this kind of mindset, the natural man. And we were limited to that, see. And when we talk to when we talk to others out there, we need to we need to think about this. You you really if you've got a lot of good things, you you got to you got to consider. You know, if they go, are they going to be able to grasp them? Uh, but we had the mind of the flesh then. But now, brother, we've got the mind of the uh, we got the mind of Christ. We have a mind that the Spirit of God can can talk to and can open these things up yeah. for us. Yeah. And I'll tell you, this is, this is, a, this is a mighty powerful uh, exhortation that Paul has given here. Mm-hmm. He has spent, now he has spent two chapters, primarily the bulk of two chapters, establishing the difference between the thinking that a man outside the, the world 
would think, and the thinking that God thinks, that the saints are capable of thinking. Now, he, he's, he's labored here, to, 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 and it's, and it's uh, very, very ingenuous the way he's approached this thing. He, first, I want to establish that you can't think. The man, man outside of God can't think like God thinks. And he's going to go on to chapter 3, and he'll say, and I can't talk to you. And he's, and he's going to be able to, they're going to understand why he can't talk to them in a spiritual, in a spiritual way. Brethren, now we can, we can relate to one another in, a, in, our, in, a, in the mind of Christ. We can deal with one another on a spiritual basis. And that's why we, we desire not to know each one after the flesh. And we can make real progress in these things. And we, we, call, we got the mind of Christ. Amen. Thank you, brethren.